Hi everyone, it's Anne with Art on the Creek. We're in my home studio in Parker, Colorado, and thank you so much for tuning in. Happy January, happy 2024. I hope that if you're watching and uh, you just celebrated Christmas, I hope that you had a really nice Christmas holiday. Time with your family, opening gifts, all the fun things, lots of food. I think a lot of you may have gotten some new art supplies for Christmas. And if you are brand new to watercolor, maybe you got something like this. This particular one is the Nick Pro set of 48 watercolors and Nick Pro sent this to me. Thank you, Nick Pro. I want to review it for you and give you some pros and cons and let you know the best way to start off in watercolor if that's one of your resolutions for 2024. Before we continue though, please subscribe to Art on the Creek if you haven't done so already by clicking on that subscribe button and turn on that notification bell too so that you'll always know when I launch a new tutorial or a product review. Of course, if you do enjoy content like this, make sure that you give it a like, leave a comment, or share it with your friends. If you'd really like to take your art skills to the next level, I would encourage you to consider a membership with Art on the Creek. When you're a member or patron of my channel, your membership includes an extensive library of tutorials covering drawings and paintings of a variety of subjects, not just beautiful Colorado, and also in many different art media. You'll have full and unlimited access to an ever-growing members library of tutorials and reviews, as well as the opportunity to receive guided feedback and critique from me. And also, you'll have direct input into which art technique or medium you'd like to learn more about as a member, as well as access to free art supplies. All of that and more is included in your membership, and it's all very conveniently right here on YouTube. There is a link in the description below that will go over all the membership details. But if you still have any questions, just ask me in the comments and I'll be sure to help you out. Now, let's move on to today's subject, shall we? I think that a lot of people are really attracted to these kinds of sets because it's a kit. It's everything you need in one place. So this is how it came packaged to me. Like I said, Nick Pro reached out to me and said, you know, we, we, uh, we've seen your channel. We like what you do. Will you please give us a review on this? And I am going to do that, but I'm going to be as honest as possible because I know that all of you who have an art supply budget want to spend it on things that are going to matter to you. Um, not that this set does not matter. It's, uh, it's got some good points um, and we are going to discover what those good points are and I'm going to try and focus on those. I like the packaging. Uh, if you're going to gift this to someone, it makes a very nice presentation. So let's see here. There's uh, 48 colors and um, on the back of the box, it does explain a little bit about the paints. Um, it talks about the names of the colors and um, how you can mix these, what all it comes with. There are eight synthetic squirrel brushes in here. And honestly, that's the, the really star, the shining star of this set. Uh, the palette is very nice, also a really good quality. It reminds me a lot of the plastic that Derwent uses in its pan sets, if you're familiar with those. Um, the inner palette can be taken out so you have more mixing space. And all of the little individual half pans in their uh, little subsets can be taken out as well. So if you wanted to work with uh, some analogous colors only, you could do that. It has a lot of potential. Um, on the back, the colors look like a really good array there, what's printed on the back. But um, when you actually swatch them out, they're a little bit similar, and we'll get into that. comes with two sponges. Um, I'm not one to really use sponges to clean my brushes. I prefer using a, uh, a paper towel or a rag, so those will probably just uh, end up in my acrylic or um, other painting uh, supplies. It comes packaged in this velvet pouch, which is really neat when you look at it at first because you think, oh wow, this is really special, a nice velvet pouch. But there's velvet fur all over the palette and I really don't want that in my paint. So I'm using a microfiber cloth to wipe it off and I'm having a hard time. There's so much static cling on it. I probably should have used a wet paper towel or something to wipe it off. Um, but after a while, I was able to get it clean. So let's see what else is in here. We have a swatch card and I like that. Right away, I can see that the swatch boxes are extremely small. Um, 
so that'll be great for just testing the colors. Has a little insert there with some uh, interesting tips on how to watercolor, and that's a nice little thing to add to someone for a kit for someone who's never really tried watercolor. Um, gives you some little bits of tips and tricks. This particular packaging of the brushes I thought was a little bit, um, a little bit much. I could I understand the outer plastic here. But then each brush is also in cellophane in addition to the protected collar that goes on the filaments. Really nice array of brushes here, but I kind of felt like the packaging was a little bit wasteful in this case. Um, they open easily enough. And let's see, the brushes that you get with the set are really quite nice. You have um, quite a bit to choose from. There is, in the round department, there's a number 12, uh, eight, a six, a four, a two, and a, uh, a zero. Is there a one also? No, a four, a two, and a zero. And then you have a number one script liner or rigger in addition to a half inch flat. So brush wise, you get a really nice set. I like the handles. I like the way they feel. They feel like they're lacquered wood. Um, the ferrules are very firmly attached. I didn't have any problems shedding with the brushes. And the points on these are really quite delightful. As I'm uh, looking these brushes over, I, everything about them, I really just feel like they're a very high quality brush. I'm surprised. I expected the ferrules to be a little bit wobbly. Um, I expected the wood to maybe not feel so good, maybe to have some, uh, some misprinting on there. But these definitely look like they're made with care and the points on the ends are really nice. Look at those points. Those are all on the, the, the rounds. I think I don't, yeah, I don't have the rigor in there. Those are all the rounds. I just thought they were really very, very nice and uh, very sturdy. And then here's the half inch flat. It comes to such a fine chisel point. I'm really excited to use this one. Look at that. It's almost like a blade. So I'm very excited to use that one. I love using flat brushes and uh, we'll try and get that painted out today. Here's this uh, little folio, little folder of um, tips and tricks, how to care for the brushes, how to care for the paints. Really um, a good thing to, to put in uh, watercolor sets. And to be honest, I wish more companies would do that. Let's take a look at this watercolor pad. Now it says it has 25 sheets. It's about an A5 size. And it says it is acid free, cold press textured, 140 pound, 300 GSM. So, you know, basically, uh, just by reading it, I would say, yeah, this is going to be great watercolor paper. So let's open it up and let's take a look and see what we're dealing with. It's, it's wrapped in cellophane, which is pretty common. And it is a glue bound pad. So glue on the top. It's not, uh, it's not a block. Right away, the color of the paper is a little bit odd. It's, it's, uh, it's not really an optic white. It's kind of a dull, dingy blue or purple to it, but that's not going to affect the, the painting at all. You can really see that linear grid pattern, but on the back, it's very smooth. Not quite hot press, but just very smooth. So um, you have two different uh, surfaces to work from. So this might be a little bit interesting to use. Now let's take a look at the palette. Uh, like I said, it's a lot like the plastic that's in the Derwent kits. So, or the Derwent palettes, it's very heavy. I really like that. It feels substantial. It feels like it's well-made. Let's try and take this inner palette out and it snaps right out very easily. You've got lots of mixing space there. Of course, the whole well on the inside. And then can you see that each of these little sections is in six individual half pan groups? Um, let's look at the brushes here for just a minute. There's a flat and a round and um, they look fine. They look like just about every other water brush. And I'll cap those up here and we'll just set those aside. Uh, it does come with a sponge in there in addition, like I said, to these two sponges. But I, again, I'm not one to use sponges. If you do use sponges uh, to clean your brushes off, then this set comes with three. So you're really quite well equipped there. I decided to speed up the swatching and uh, prepping the paints on this section. Um, I did go through and just with an eyedropper, I put a little drop of, of water on each of the pans. They re-wet just fine. They start just fine. So far, they're meeting my expectations. One thing I am noticing uh, about the swatches though, if you take a look, they all have kind of a neon bent to them. They're all vibrant in a way that's uh, really bright. Like look at those purples and, and the Sienna is actually a red. It's a nice red. I like it, but it's not, um, not at all what I would have expected. Maybe perhaps they mean some kind of a Venetian red, but anything that is in here, a lot of the colors that are named are just not 
quite like the colors that you would expect to find uh, when you're dealing with uh, traditional watercolors. Now in this first test I want to use the Nick Pro paper pad to test it. I've got um, one with the textured side up and one with the smooth side up. When I tore it off the pad it really tore and I guess well that one came off okay so maybe it's me. The texture of this paper just feels strange. It feels more paper towel-y than it does uh, watercolor paper. I don't know. I, I'm not, uh, I'm feeling kind of skeptical. I don't have a lot of high hopes for this paper. Now that I've got both of these taped down to my board, and that's just a back of another uh, block of watercolor paper, I'm using a uh, Thalo Blue Faber-Castell watercolor pencil, and I'm just going to kind of roughly sketch in a snowy owl. The one on the left here, the painting on the left, is on the smooth side of the paper, and I want to use the, uh, the half inch flat to do this, so um, right away I'm feeling like I need a little bit bigger brush to, uh, to really get this paper wet, but I'll go ahead and uh, use a spray bottle and really get it wet, and then I'll just spread that around, but right away it kind of feels like the paper may not be sized either correctly or uh, all the way. I, I don't really know what, what words to use there. The water is acting a little bit strangely on the paper. It feels like it's absorbing it too much. But I'm going to continue and uh, I think I'll try and use the sponge to kind of blot up some of this bead of water that is on the bottom. And I don't know if you can tell, but it just brutalized the paper. It just tore it right up. Um, the papers, the water's sitting kind of in, in uneven levels of puddles on the paper and now I'm having to take the paper that frayed off with that sponge and flick it off so it doesn't uh, get into the, to the paint. So right away the paper is, is not my friend. Um, the, the palette is fine. At the mixing on this plastic is, is no problem. It's working really well. I'm going to go in with this first blue, which is their, uh, the sky blue. And um, what we're going to do is paint kind of a pink and blue snow owl here. So I'm just kind of doing the snow shadows here. And I'm going to mix in some of the colors that they give you. There's so many convenience colors in here that there really isn't a need to mix. Um, and in fact, when you mix some of these colors, you come up with some unexpected results. So just like when you're using dye-based watercolors, uh, these, and I don't mean that for all dye-based, but um, for some of them, when you mix them, there's other colors underneath there in the dyes that when they mix with other colors you might expect uh, a certain shade to result but in actuality you're going to get something entirely different so uh, your mixes here you might have to adjust what you do to get some good uh, good mixes going as far as wet on wet goes on this side of the paper it's acting a little bit weird it just doesn't really feel quite like the watercolor paper that i'm used to so while this one, while I'm working on this one, I'm going to let it dry for a little bit, let it get to the to where there's not quite as much water on there, and I'll go ahead and get the next side set up. Now on the right hand side, this is the textured side of the paper that's face up. Um, it's acting a little bit better, but still not 100% cooperatively, not quite what I'm used to in a watercolor paper. Again, the, the moisture, the water just tends to kind of want to sit still. Um, I'm using wet on wet techniques here, but the paint really isn't flowing anywhere. It's just kind of sitting in one place. Honestly, I'm feeling a little bit like I, well, not like I have to fight it, but that I, I have to change the style and the way in which I'm painting. And, um, you know, I, I'm an advocate for that to really know your supplies and adapt your style to what your supplies are doing. But this paper was just so weird, um, and, and I'm sorry I don't have a better adjective for it. It just didn't act normal. It was way too absorbent. Uh, the watercolor paper, the, the water the water in the watercolor really kind of gets into the paper, but it actually acts as a vehicle for your watercolor to move and flow and let the, let the paint play on the paper. This one, it just kind of absorbed it and just helped it to sit there. So that's where my frustration is in the paper. I have to say, though, the brushes were purely delightful. I had no trouble using them. Um, one of them, the two, has a really tremendous hair point on it, and I may end up giving that a little bit of a trim. Um, but if you're using detail in florals or anything like that, that brush is really astounding. It's, uh, it's very nice, and I like the amount of paint that the brush has held. I had no problems with the brushes at all. Um, these are just real quick kind of sketch paintings, uh, if you will, and uh, I do like the one on the right better. However, with the beak, on both of them, I had a lot of trouble with the 
doing some negative painting. It just wasn't going to cooperate. So I am going to just set this paper aside and let's go to a paper that I really know and love. This is the B 100% Cotton Watercolor Journal. And I think I'm going to try and paint something else. I really want to give these paints a fair shot. And I think that the paper really gives it a hurdle that's completely unnecessary. So as I was looking around trying to find a subject, something to demonstrate for you here, I decided why not just do that rose that's on the cover of the, the watercolor paper that came with the kit. And once again, I'm using that half inch flat, really falling in love with this brush. I really like it. And I'm just doing a real abstract version of that rose there that's on the cover. And I'm, I'm finding that when I'm mixing with um, all of these pinks, and I think I used all nine there, if you count up from the uh, from the bottom in that uh, second row from the left, if you just kind of go up, I used all nine pinks or reds on this particular flower, and I felt like they were much the same. Um, did not have any trouble mixing a dark for the background though, so I was quite pleased with that. I was able to vary the mix, and it performed exactly on this paper as I expected it would. I'm dropping in, forcing some cauliflower blooms, uh, putting some other colors in the background and really enjoying how bright these are. So for florals, honestly, I think this palette is really kind of excellent. It it lends a little bit neon, like I said, but I think for if you're working in a journal or in your sketchbook and you really want to work on florals I or or if you do abstract art and really just like bright colors, what else would be good? Maybe a seascape with... Um, uh, some uh, some boats on the on the shore something that would have a lot of bright color kayaks surfing anything like that um, here in Colorado I tend to go more toward the deep earthy colors because that's my landscape um, but uh, if you are one to live in a climate that has really bright vibrant colors uh, in a much more tropical climate say um, even Florida all of these kinds of areas I think this particular palette is a beautiful selection of colors now they do say, I think on here somewhere, that they're professional artist colors. Um, they're not. They're, they, they do say professional quality, artist choice, professional quality. They're not. They're, they're hobby paints. They're student paints. So don't, uh, don't be fooled. <laughs> don't walk into this blindly and think you're going to end up getting, uh, you know, a really high quality, something that's going to compare with, say, your Daniel Smith or your Da Vinci paints. Nothing, nothing like that is going to happen with this set. This is the Ultramarine Blue. It's not right. It's it's very foggy. It's very gray. Um, it's just not an ultramarine. So see, that's what I mean about these colors not quite being what you would expect. Um, that's the blue that they decided to label ultramarine. So, you know, and here's the sienna. I love this color. It's like a, a really nice lip red or a, a blood. And I bet you could use it to mix uh, a skin tone really well. That is one thing I did not try with this set because they have so many uh, flesh tones in here. They do have one that's called Flesh Tint and it definitely aims toward the Caucasian. But then they have a light orange, an ochre, a sandy brown, a goldenrod, uh, the brown and the burned umber. All of those would really lend toward beautiful skin tones without really having to mix. And you could do a broad array of, uh, of uh, skin tones with that. Um, just showing you how red based this brown is. It's um, the, okay, the second blue that I did is a cobalt, and that's pretty accurate. But that brown that, that uh, was just labeled as, uh, as brown, it's very pink. It's, very, it's got a very burgundy tone to it. So these are all things that we need to take into, into account when we're mixing. I'm trying to mix uh, a gray now, and I've got the Prussian blue and that brown, and trying to really get in there and create a gray. Um, what I ended up creating on this first attempt is more of a, see it looks gray when you're, when you just got a small amount, but when we um, add some water to it and create a larger wash, you're going to see how it lends more toward a neutral tint, which is fine. You can absolutely use that in your paintings. You can uh, use it as a shadow. You can uh, tint with it and come up with some good success. Um, here's the black. Look how green it looks next to these uh, next to these colors. So you can see that the black definitely is very warm uh, based, which is fine. Um, you can use it; it'll be just fine. Just uh, interesting to know. Let's mix now. Let's mix that burnt umber. Um, it was the brown before, but now I'm going to mix the burnt umber with the Prussian blue, and uh, let's see what we can come up with there. As far as a, a I'm trying to mix a neutral gray. So there's the the. Burnt, uh, burnt Umber and the Prussian Blue. 
and we'll try that one next to this black up here and it is much more neutral it, it's pulling a little bit toward the blue so i'm going to try and make some more brown in it here but i ultimately i was successful in being able to mix a much more neutral uh, gray or dark as opposed to that one at the bottom there that's kind of um, pulling purple this paper i don't know if you can tell from the camera it, uh, through the camera if this is conveyed but that the brush kind of just drags on it um, definitely not a fan of the paper but you know that's not to say you can't use it uh, but let's go ahead and let's do something else here on this B watercolor paper I have a, a drawing I've done here with a, another Faber-Castell watercolor pencil this is the walnut watercolor pencil and this particular drawing is of a fawn uh, so I'm going to use a lot of wet on wet techniques and I really want to compare this one to another type of student paint that I recommend so let's get in here first and foremost and start with that sienna which is uh, turns out to be a real rosy pink when it's wet on wet um, that was a surprise to me i expected it to be more of an earthy pink uh, we're just going to go in and i'll speed this up here and we can see how the paint performs on this b watercolor paper so right away i'm liking the paints much better they still don't have the right amount of flow though and actually at this point I've decided that that's not a factor. It was really that paper that was annoying. Um, I'm able to get the paint to do what I want it to do for the most part on this steer, and um, it's not an unpleasant experience at all. It's just really that paper that I don't recommend using. Um, I didn't have any trouble getting him to come to fruition pretty much the way I wanted him to. I was not pleased with the spots on his back because that, for wet on wet technique, that particular area didn't really perform as well as I wanted it to. However, I like the stylized way it looked in the end. So um, overall, not disappointed with it and uh, really did enjoy painting the deer quite a bit. Uh, felt like it, it turned out okay. And um, if I were working in watercolor as a, a fairly new person, I would not have been disappointed. I didn't have the kinds of struggles that I had when I was using professional watercolor to start out with on Canson XL paper. That's always what I say. That was my big frustration was using that paper. Um, nothing against Canson, nothing against that particular paper. If you use it, great and love it. That's wonderful. But for me, for the way that I was learning, it proved to be a huge struggle for me. So now let's hit this again and let's try something new entirely so i've had a couple of days to play with these paints and i'm having a, a difficult time making a conclusion as to where to rank them um, for definitely a hobbyist set or a student set so i'm going to lean more toward the hobbyist because if you are a student honestly i think that there's a lot of potential here to become frustrated uh, let me let me move this out of the way here and uh, we can go over again what uh, what everything comes with so you're given a swatch card which is nice but the the swatches are so small um, I would have preferred one that was the full size here that you could actually you know make a make a decent swatch but this is fine it's adequate it works. It's very interesting that the watercolor paper that is with the swatch card isn't even close to this watercolor paper. Uh, you can see right off the color is very different. This one has kind of a grayish or a blue, maybe a lilac tone to it. It does not feel like watercolor paper. It doesn't act like watercolor paper. Um, I don't know what the deal is with the paper, but I, I cannot recommend this paper for anyone. It's they say it's acid-free cold press paper, but the sizing in it is just so strange. The texture, I can get past the texture. I've had uh, heavily textured watercolor papers like that before. But let me just show you, for example, how the paper acts um, with a set that I do recommend for my students, which is the Paul Rubens set. But uh, this one, let's just use this brush. The brushes I love. I think they're great brushes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, for the price honestly it's uh, it's a really good set of brushes so let's see let's go in with a green here and we'll just kind of paint on this a little bit come back in with just a little bit more water so that I can spread it around the the paper 
acts strange and I want to show you this with all watercolor well with other watercolor too because I, I didn't want you to think that it was just the watercolor that was making the paper weird um, can you see how this texture it affects what you paint so that's our first that's our first uh, I don't know what to call it not a red flag beige flag we'll go with a beige flag <laughs> um, the the paint just kind of I don't know it doesn't move too much this Paul Rubens paint really does have good flow to it I have no problem with it in fact let's try it on this other watercolor paper that feels a little bit more like watercolor paper and that certainly acts more like watercolor paper can you see how the the paint is uh, is flowing in here a little bit more do you see that movement um, let's add in uh, another color here some yellow you can see how it really flows and moves around at least I hope you can let's do this in a better way where we can mix some colors let's start with yellow and we'll put some yellow on here this is the Paul Rubens paint now we're ju I'm just uh, really focusing on this paper so here's the Paul Rubens paint and we're gonna come in with a blue and drop some blue in there so you really have to give it an assist if you want it to mix on there it stayed blue on the top but where I'm agitated it at the bottom it mixed okay now let's try it on a more um, I and I don't even know what this watercolor paper is but this is what they give you for the swatch it mixes and blends and flows just so much better we get we get color mixing throughout here it's only on the bottom half I the paper is going to give you a lot of struggle and then on the back of the paper I don't know if I'm explaining this very well it's just very difficult to use first of all it doesn't it does not tear out of here well at all uh, but on the back of the paper if we were to mix let's try here's some red and you think okay well this paper this backside might be a little bit better to use so we'll try that uh, let's mix this blue the blue is sitting on top of the red it's not really blending and becoming purple let's try it on this one now same thing the red and I'll go in with that blue same blue I I'm hoping you can see this this is really becoming a purple this is blue on red it's not mixing the same way so that's the first hurdle I really don't like the paper um, actually there was one little hurdle before that and that's this velvet case it is very nice but it did shed quite a bit on this plastic Let's see if I can get it to come off again yes and when I first opened it I had to dust the entire thing very thoroughly and that this velvet really wants to stick on here so I I don't recommend keeping this it's a nice case but because it's velvet it sticks to this plastic in a very unpleasant way uh, I do like that the palette comes out of the case and you have a lot of mixing space that part is very very good let's see if I can get to go back in there are little pegs right there oh I see it goes up higher there so that part is very nice the sponges uh, come out in case you wanted to put full-length brushes in there I like that I'm not one to really use a sponge um, I prefer having a paper towel or a rag so um, the sponges are uh, they make no difference to me but you do get um, you do get three of them if that's something you like to use then you've got your sponges I have not tested the water brushes so um, let's do that let's take a look at these now these feel um, these are the kind that you twist to the right to open 
just filling it with my spray bottle here. So I'm going to twist it to the left to get it to close. Let me move this out of the way. And I'm going to go back to my preferred watercolor paper, which this is the B watercolor paper. And let's just try playing with, with the brush a little bit. You just squeeze the brush to get the water to come out, and it does very easily. And let's just try some blue here. The paint's re-wet well. That part's not going to be a factor. This particular blue does not have a lot of oomph to it. The water brushes work fairly well. Uh, let me just let's just use the other one too because it is a different a different uh, uh, filament shape. The cap posts, which is always a plus for me. Let's get this uh, going here. There we go. So this is a straight flat brush, a stroke brush. And as you can see, it works just fine. The thing that I have found to be just really frustrating with these watercolors is that, you know, they say that uh, wet on wet works very well with these. So let's, let's try it. We'll put down some yellow. And this is on watercolor paper that I know will perform well. So there's the yellow. Let's get some uh, some red here, kind of the magenta, and we'll more of a hot pink. Really, we'll put those colors right next to one another and see what they do. There is some blending, but not a lot. Let's try it with same thing. We'll use the same brush. Go into the lemon yellow here on the Paul Rubens. And then into uh, a red. And right away, you can see the yellow charging into the red. That's not characteristic of those two particular pigments per se. It's just that these paints don't want to move, um, which makes wet on wet techniques rather difficult. You see how this, when I added the green to the blue here, it ends up kind of sitting on top of it. Um, not a pleasant experience. So that part, but see, that's the thing, right? For me, for an artist, this is not what I would want. However, it's aimed at hobbyists and beginners. So if I have never tried watercolor before and what I wanted to do was just create some nice flowers or something, I think this set would be just fine. Just to give you kind of an example, I want to go ahead and paint this deer again using the Paul Rubens paints. And again, this is the 100% cotton B watercolor paper. Uh, let's go through and see how differently these paints perform now. I don't have all of the identical colors that I used over here, but uh, we'll definitely be able to approximate and come close. I'm just gonna fold this under so that We've got a full view there, and um, I did the same thing. I drew it with the Faber-Castell watercolor pencil, and now I'm going in and using the same brush. I'm gonna try some wet on wet here. I'll start with the ear, and uh, in this case, we'll go in here with this brown. So right away, I can tell that the paints are acting the way that I expect wet on wet paints to act. 
I'm not going to mix too many colors on here because I didn't on the other set. So we'll try and just use what we've got. The thing about these browns is that they're not nearly as pink. Um, all of the browns in that set, the Nick Pro set, they just tend to have a lot of pink tones to them. So I don't think that uh, as far as painting nature or uh, landscapes, uh, I think they're really designed for painting things like florals or cartoons, characters, things like that. I need to mix some of this brown with some ultramarine or cobalt, something to try and get some gray going here. Let's go into some of this lighter red, maybe some burnt sienna over here. Lighter brown, rather. Paints are just acting more as I would expect them to. They are, they've got better flow. They're playing on the paper nicely together. And they're really allowing me to use the techniques I want to use to my fullest advantage. Kind of get this portion a little bit wet here. And this is where we were kind of doing a little bit of trying to drop in the wet on wet to create the fawn's spotted coat. And it's just the subtlety of it is working better on this particular, with this particular paint. Let's see, we'll put some pink over here in the ears. Mix some red and brown. Part of what I mean by the paints uh, having enough flow and working, I'm going to put a, a darker shadow here under the jawline of our fawn. And I will come back and uh, agitate that pigment with some clear water. And you can see how it can soften the edge. That's a technique that I use often. In fact, just about in every painting. And uh, with the Nick Pro paints, it was just really difficult to pull that off. It didn't want to soften. It just really wanted to remain hard. And when you're stuck with hard edges, you might have to adjust the way you paint. So any kind of a, a graphic design would be fine with these. But I think if you're looking at anything soft or subtle, uh, a different brand of paints is going to suit you better. Another essential watercolor technique that I use a lot is this lifting off technique to create subtle highlights. Very difficult to do with the Nick Pro paints. So let's just make some side-by-side -side comparisons here and see what we think. Now there's no denying that they're very similar, but look at the texture in this paint. You can really see how it, we have these soft blending areas and we're able to create subtle shading around the brow. Here, the areas don't blend as nicely. There's a lot of hard edges in here and this was all done with the same techniques. So even though both paintings turned out just fine, I think that if you're looking to really learn actual watercolor techniques, you're better off with a set like the Paul Rubens or something else. If you're, if you already know what you're doing and you just want something uh, to play with and uh, work in a journal, then this Nick Pro set is fine. And um, that's the best advice I can give you for this set. Honestly, for the eight brushes alone, I think it's an excellent purchase. And um, if it's something that you think you might enjoy, there is that affiliate link and coupon code for you in the description. Take care, guys. We'll see you next week. Bye now.